I was um I was thinking actually when I, I messaged you, it was only yesterday we had a, a real quick turnaround, but it must have been it's like pushing two years since you were last on the show. I was living in an apartment in the city, um, and we we're at I don't know if you know where Point Lonsdale is, a little bit out past Geelong now, but we made the move yep. down here about probably a year and a half ago. And I when I was thinking about reaching out to you, I thought I must have been sort of six to twelve months ago, but sort of blew my mind that uh there was there was so much water between the two conversations, but. You're still over in, you were just telling me about the weather there, but you're still in Colorado? Still in Boulder, Colorado. So uh, coming up to 14 years. Yeah, far out, man. You were saying uh, uh, that you're copping the, the real the real tough side of uh, mountain life at the moment. Well, normally, you know, Colorado celebrates and promotes itself as a place that gets 300 days of sunshine. But over the last uh, probably four or five years, I'd say it's a heck of a lot less. And it's got really, really cold. So normally, you know, you get some snow, but uh, the sun would melt it fairly quickly and the paths would be clear and the roads would be clear. But we've had some real Arctic weather uh, over the last couple of months. And we're talking like minus, you know, uh, in some cases, you know, minus 10, 15 degrees Celsius. So it's been pretty, pretty brutal because the snow doesn't melt and makes it extremely hard for coaching when I've got to get guys out there training. So they've been maximizing the dread mill uh, a fair bit <laughs> this winter, but um, we're off to California this weekend uh, to Huntington beach. So it will be good to have four days and some nice weather and get away from the cold snap that we've had here. Oh, what are you guys doing down there? I've got about 20 runners running in uh, an event called the surf city marathon. So I've got one guy running a marathon and I've got, about 18 running a half marathon and I've got one person running a 5k. So you know, I coach about 50, 60 people of um, varying abilities, those that can run a, a 240 marathon through to those that are trying to break five hours for a marathon. Um, and so, yeah, just I said to the group, um, you know, basically in November, December, who would be interested in doing a race sort of in February and I find that it helps keep people motivated and help keeps them accountable, particularly when the weather's bad. Uh, we did it last year. We ended up going to uh, Phoenix, Arizona and doing a race there called the Mesa Marathon. And again, we had about 20 people that uh, that opted to do it and it worked really well and it helped kickstart everyone going into the spring. So we have a really big race here in May called the Boulder Boulder that you know has around 40,000 people. So um, if you haven't started training by the time March rolls around, you're usually way behind the eight ball and getting fit and getting ready to race. So uh, doing little things like this in, you know, setting up a race sort of towards the end of February, uh, towards the end of winter, but in, in February allows them to stay focused during um, December and January where the weather's really bad and they start questioning whether they really want to run. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that's true. It's funny. I've I've always been the same. I um well actually the reason I reached out to you now is because I was on Let's Run the other day trying to find. I reckon you've written the most simple and effective marathon plan that I'd ever seen. Um, I've completely blanked on his name. Who is who's your boy who qualified for the marathon? It was a little bit of a surprise to a lot of people. Was it Jack or or Jake. Josh? Jake. Sorry, yeah, Jake I knew Riley. it was a, yeah. I knew it was a Jake. I was I was looking for for his training program because I'm going to do the Melbourne Marathon this year, and I reckon you start looking at your own training history and you start reading some of the programs online and even me who's been in the sport for so long can get overwhelmed by all the information that's available so I was like all right I remember seeing your write-up of of Jake's training plan and it was everything that you need and it was simple to follow and it was it, it didn't look magic on the surface but I mean in terms of trying to apply a routine like that consistently for for a fair amount of time like he would have had to do I guess is the magic and uh, I was reading through it again the other day. I thought, gee, that's a bloody uh, a good bit of advice. So that was a that was a little bit of a catalyst for reaching out. But even myself coming back, and I'm I'm not you know aiming to break any records as much as just try and have a good run. But even still, the idea of just trying to break up the training with some races and um, just the atmosphere of getting out amongst some other runners, it's it's a nice excuse to to get out and have a faster run. And a lot of the time, I'm sure you remember from back in the day as well. It's it's so much easier to jump back into a a 10k race and have a good hard hit out and run a bit faster than what you'd do if you were just doing a time trial by yourself and then you've got the bonus depending on whether you're an extrovert or introvert of having that social that little social outlet on the outside so what well, that's a that's a like a a little bit of a planned process for all your athletes to break up the training routines or the race routines with 
some smaller races? Yeah, I think it's important to just change the stimulus a little bit. I think if, you know, you were to do a marathon training block of 16 weeks and just focus on that training for 16 weeks, you know, there are some benefits, but then there are also some detriments to it. And I normally find that people get stale, they get stagnant, um, they end up getting injured because they push themselves too hard and they're training for such a long period of time. So throwing in some races means that, you know, if it's a minor race, you know, they might taper only a couple of days beforehand and then they'll take it easy for a couple of days after. So the couple of days before and the couple of days after, they're not really doing a lot, which means their body can absorb the training that they've done, can absorb the hit out that they've got and just allow them to, you know, move into that next week of training, you know, just feeling just a little bit better. If it's a bigger race, then obviously the taper would be a little bit longer. But, you know, as I tell all my athletes that tapering into the race is also to absorb all the training that you've done. And, you know, a sponge can only hold so much water before all of a sudden it falls flat and doesn't go anywhere. So, you know, it's okay to wring the the sponge out to get a little bit of the water out to keep absorbing, um, you know, the spills that take place. But like I said, for our athletes, you know, I look at three or four races, maybe a half marathon in that block. I definitely love throwing in like a five mile or an 8K or a 10K um, just because they don't have to taper as much and they can recover fairly quickly. And being at altitude, people get to a point where the altitude negates leg turnover and speed because, you know, the higher up you are, the less oxygen there is. And it just means that you can't roll the legs over as fast as what you can at sea level. So if you're stuck in a really long, dormanted plan, it just means that eventually you're going to end up being slower. You'll be stronger because of the the altitude, but you also need leg turnover for fluency and feeling good. And if you jump into a race and you're not feeling great and you don't have that leg turnover, it's going to be a long and tough day at the office. So we try to you know, pull different things in uh, during an athlete's block. And it also allows them to be excited, you know, to train for such a long period of time without racing mm. for some people can be really hard. You forget all the little idiosyncrasies that come with a race, you know, like when do I leave to the airport? What time should I give myself at the airport? What should I be packing when I get off the plane? You know, should I go for a shuffle? Um, particularly with time zone changes here, you know, you could head to the East Coast and there's a time difference of two hours. So adjusting to that time zone. And then if you went to the West Coast, there's a difference of an hour. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, um, getting athletes refined and retuned into traveling and practicing their craft so that when the bigger races come along, they can put what they've learned and what they've practiced to the true test. Yeah. How easy is it for you guys to get down to close to sea level? Is it is that a big task or is that possible? I feel like I was talking to Benita a while ago and I don't know if I'm making this up, but I think she said when she was in Colorado, she was surprised at how easy it was to access some faster trails or maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting two people muddled up. Is it easy to, to get down to sea level where you're at? No, it's not. Not in Colorado, okay. but if you're in Arizona, like Flagstaff, Arizona, it's just a simple drive uh, down the highway and you can end up in Phoenix, uh, training in Phoenix. Um, some go down to Sedona which is just a a little further down. It drops to about 4,000 feet rather than being up at 7,000 feet. But in Colorado, you've got to drive a good six hours before you're actually getting down. So you'd have to head into Nebraska uh, to get to sea level. Yeah, okay. I don't know know who I'm thinking of when I tell you that story. Sorry to make Benita look silly there if you're listening, Benita. (laughs) So, well, that's the reason you you get down to to LA uh, or California to, to try and tap into that. I guess it's killing two birds with one stone in the sense that you're you're getting that race hit out, but you're also getting that uh, that ability to turn your legs over at a bit of a faster pace. Yeah, so the group that I'm taking, they're obviously you know fairly nervous because of the fact that we have had a a really tough winter, and so a lot of them don't feel um, as fit as they would like. They don't feel as fast as what they would like. But the trip to um, California is just to break up the end of the winter for them. So, you know, some are going to run well, some are probably going to get close to what they're aiming for. But it's just a a change of stimulus to get them out of Colorado, to go away together as a team. You know, I've got someone that will probably run around about 75 minutes as our quickest athlete. But then I've got someone that's aiming for two hours and 15 minutes uh, for the half marathon. So, um, as I said, we're going away as a group. There's a 
wide varying difference in ability and ages, um, which is one of the joys of coaching community people. You know, all these people have families and jobs and running is an outlet for them and they get excited doing these type of things, which is a different way of coaching elites because everything is on a knife's edge for them. But this is going to be a great way for them to start 2023. We'll have gone away together as a team, uh, race together as a team. We'll have a, um, a social event at the Airbnb that we've rented out on Sunday night. And then everyone will come back to Colorado. They'll recover and then they'll get themselves ready for, you know, the real part of the year of what they're training for, which could be Grandma's Marathon in June, Chicago in October, New York. You know, as I said, there's a whole varying um, amounts of ability. Um, our elites are sort of, you know, we've just had USA Cross Country Championships. I've got a few elites that are going to be running indoors in Boston in a couple of weeks. Uh, we've got a big 10K in California uh, coming up in the first week of, of March. Jake's coming back from a double Achilles uh, surgery that he had last year. So we're hoping we're going to have him racing uh, mid-March to late March. And then he's got a, a big summer of racing coming up with the goal of hopefully Berlin Marathon in September. So, you know, the group that I'm going away with, you know, this is fun for them. Like they don't get the opportunity to do this. Uh, whereas with my elites, you know, they're going to be backwards and forwards, you know, every couple of weeks, depending on what the races are that they're doing. So interesting hearing about the way that different coaches and different athletes prepare for events. I was having a chat to a, a friend of mine last night at the Comics Lounge here in Melbourne, and he was telling me about John McEnroe in the tennis back in the well, he was he was sort of seventies, wasn't he? That he was rocking and rolling early eighties, eighties, yep, eighties, yeah. And uh, he was saying that he he didn't train like what he did when he wanted to practice tennis was he'd go out and he'd just play doubles because for him that was fun. And a lot of people looked at him and compared him to like a number of other world number ones. Uh, sorry, a number of other top level players. I'm saying like if you just trained like these guys, if you got out and spent 10 hours a day putting in the work and getting your recovery and stuff right, you'd be unstoppable in a sense. So he went out and apparently for, for one year committed to the idea of trying to train at that kind of level and he just got real stale. Like I guess to use your analogy, the sponge maybe got a little bit too full. And uh, I heard Kyrgios, and I, I don't know how easy you can compare a tennis player like Kyrgios to a bloke like John McEnroe, but... In terms of approach, I heard him say a while ago that for him to spend that amount of time training, it's it's just going to make him stale and not enjoy his tennis. Whereas a bloke like Djokovic seems to take more of that uh, <laughs> that ten hour a day kind of approach. But is that difficult for you? With the well, you said you got fifty or sixty athletes, like do you find it hard to to manage that, or do you just go through? I guess you've been doing it for a little while now. Is it just trial and error? Um, or have you got some things you swear by in terms of uh, the, the key elements of, of preparation? Obviously, things like long runs sort of go without saying, but is there anything else that um, sort of goes into the, the key scaffolding for, for all of your athletes, regardless of, of what level they're at? So you coach to personality. Um, the year This year, the word that I've got my athletes focused on is attitude. Now, when you come to training, what's your attitude? When you go to a race, what's your attitude? When we've got, you know, the apocalypse of snow come in, what's your attitude when it mm. comes to training? And I think, you know, you have to mirror training in and around everyone's attitude. Like you mentioned John McEnroe. John McEnroe was an extrovert. You can't make John McEnroe an introvert. And to turn around and say, this is what you need to do to be better, what you're doing is you're trying to take the perfect specimen of man and saying that this is what they need to do. And I know I've had this conversation with you previously and I've had this conversation with uh, a number of people that uh, do podcasts and have written stories on me. When I decided to go from being an extrovert to an introvert, it backfired. Mm -hmm. And when you are, you feel like a rat in a cage. You just like, you go to bed at a certain time, you get up at a certain time, you're training twice a day, physical therapy, massage, you're eating healthy, you're getting in the right micronutrients, macronutrients, you're doing everything. And I always needed to blow out steam. You know, as I said, I was an extrovert to go out and have a couple of beers or more than a couple of beers. You know, not when I was not when I was in like phases of training for the Olympics. Like I never touched a drink of alcohol going into the Olympic Games. And it's ironic when I look back on my career that if I was prepping for a London marathon, everything was within my control and I did everything right. And if I wanted to go out and have a couple of beers, I would. I'd primarily do that on a Sunday night because I'd have already ran my long run Sunday morning, done my double Sunday afternoon. I knew Monday was going to be an easy day. So I changed some of the things that I knew that I needed to do 
in and around my training. So I wouldn't do it on a Friday night when I had to do the hill workout with Mona on a Saturday morning. But, you know, I'd do it on a Sunday night. And not a lot of people would go out on a Sunday night. And most places are closed at 1 a.m. So it wasn't like you'd be out at 4 a.m. and, you know, doing a whole heap of silly stuff. So I think for me, when I look back on my career, when I had everything balanced and I controlled everything, I ran well. When I forced myself to be something that I wasn't, it backfired. So going away with these people this weekend, they're not elite athletes. They're just everyday people that just love to run. They're running to lose weight. They want to run PRs. Some of them have never run a half marathon before. And I don't have to be so forthright with them. I don't have to really be hard on them because for them, it's a choice. And if they don't want to come to training, I don't get on the phone and call them. Like they're already paid me, right? They pay me, you know, every month or they pay me every quarter. And if they don't come to training, it's their choice. And normally they won't come to training because it's too cold or they've decided they want to go skiing for the weekend um, or they've decided to go on a family holiday um, or at school holidays. And so they need to be home. So there's a whole heap of reasons as to why these runners or these people will be in and then out and they're committed and they're not committed because life sometimes gets in the way with the elite guys. It's completely different. You don't get a life outside of running. Like running is what you do. Like it should be your religion and you have to be committed. You can't just pack up and go away for a weekend or you just can't go skiing, you know, when you're in the build up of a big marathon, because this is your job. You're trying to make um, an Olympic team or, or a US or Australian team. And so you don't get anything without sacrificing and you have to sacrifice things in order to achieve the holy grail of what it is that you're searching for. And it, changing your personality doesn't get you any closer to the holy grail. If anything, you know, there are some people that may have to make uh, decisions in their life to better help them. And there are some that just you know need to just loosen the straps a little bit because they're too wound, uh, too wound up. So, you know, to your, question that you asked I base my coaching on attitude and you know if these athletes want to be the best in the world and they want to make national teams then the way I coach them is a completely different way than someone that's just running for fun and you know is going to turn up to training twice a week and come away to a couple of races but their life is work family and all these other commitments and running is just an outlet for them yeah it's such a it's such a great approach coaching to personality I remember, I remember for a long time growing up, I, I sort of flirted with those two areas as well. Like I'm right on the, the sort of cusp of being an introvert and the extrovert. So um, in terms of getting the social fix, I used to like getting out to races and things like that. But I, I always found it difficult to comprehend a bloke like McEnroe when I was younger and no one had explained it to me as well as you just had then in terms of coaching to personality. But the, I wonder what that is. Like it's interesting to look at a sport like running and – it's nice as a coach to think that the idea of some cookie cutter model just works, that you can just, um, you know, print and repeat and just see how people respond to that. But the idea that, uh, you know, a, a Djokovic and a McEnroe are going to operate in the same way, just to use that tennis analogy again, seems a little bit crazy. Well, I wonder what that is. Like, did you notice that's a, a, a bit of a, a mindset in the running world? Like I've had a lot to do with quite a lot of coaches and um, with the exception of, probably Adam Diddick, uh, who, I, who I spent the last year of my career with, I, I felt as though there was a lot more attention paid on purely the running side of the training. And then when it came to actually looking outside the box of, you know, how an athlete might respond based on their personality, it was, it, it just never really seemed to be a conversation. That could have more to do with the um, coaches and great coaches they were in, in their own regard, but it just wasn't a, a common experience for me to be aware of what you just explained. Well, I think we're more mentally centric now than we are physically centric. And I think a lot of that has to do with the pandemic and mental health and, you know, making sure people are, you know, really in tune with what's going on and checking in on people. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people know that I lost an elite athlete that committed suicide in 2018. And it certainly um, changed the way that I coach and how, um, how I'm involved in, in coaching now. And, you know, I just, I look back when I was a kid and it was one of those ones that was like, get in, sit down, shut up and hold on. And that's yeah. what you did. You know, I looked at the best athletes, you just shut up, you didn't say a word unless you were asked. And then when I became a good athlete, 
I pretty much, it was the same thing. Well, I'd go to Falls Creek. We'd be up there for three weeks. If someone wanted to try and, you know, two-step me, I'd grind them into the ground, right? And egos and attitudes and, you know, that was just the Australian way. And if I got, you know, my tail handed to me, I'd come back the next day and try something different. Um, but as we've got older, there are so many more complexities that have come into it. You know, uh, if you just look at today, people's wages haven't gone up and people are struggling to survive from week to week and inflation is driving, you know, the cost of living even higher. Um, you know, so to get to races now, it's more expensive from airfares, hotels, race entry fees. And these kids are putting in all this time and effort. And sometimes it's actually just coming back and saying, hey, I know you want this. I can see how hard you want this. But the more you chase it, the more you're pushing it away. You know, so like, let's just stop. Let's take a breath. Let it come to you. Like, let let everything that you're striving for come to you. Like, let's keep everything normal, everything natural. And, you know, it's tough because I've seen people with so much ability but they've fallen short because they are just mentally over the top. Like everything is on a knife edge with them. And then you'll see the flip side when you see someone like a McEnroe who looks like he doesn't care, but I mean, he's got all the ability and whether you like it or not, he, he trained. I mean, whether it was with a wooden racket or whatever, he wouldn't get away with it today. Right. Um, If you look at some of the, you know, Steve Jones, for example, like you wouldn't get away with some of that stuff today. It's just a different world that we live in. But at that time, they were so good and they were so balanced and they were so charismatic that they could. So I think as we move along, we certainly see a shift, you know, probably every six to eight years, probably six years, I would say. Um, and you really have to be mindful of what's going on up here. You know, the physical side you can see, uh, you know, whether an athlete's putting in or not putting in, you know, whether you need to motivate them, you know, whether you need to pull them back a little bit, but you just never know what's going on up here. And I think social media has changed a lot of how some of these kids see the world and they're not looking at it through the true lens that they should. And they make too many comparisons. And I think that's where things start to fall apart. So, you know, again, back in my day, I didn't have this stuff, right? I just ran. And then we'd be up at Falls Creek and, you know, we'd go to Milch and have a coffee or we'd go to the Snowman because way back in the day, it was the only place you could go. It was a convenience store that everyone would congregate at and you'd tell stories. And I was a sponge. I'd listen to everything that was going on. But now there's just, there's just too much. And, you know, we talk about some of the great athletes that we have, but a lot of them aren't integrated into our society or to our community or to our charities because all of a sudden they're just on this pedestal that, you know, I don't think they should be because what happens is when that all falls apart, then they've got nothing on else in their life. And then that's when we see things fall out of control with depression and suicide and and things like that. So there's not really one straight answer in how we are today compared to what we used to be, but it's really important for coaches that if they're going to get involved in this, that, 85%, 90% is the physical side of it and 10 to 15% is the mental and emotional side. And that 10 or 15% theoretically is really 100%. Yeah. I was listening to Ali Kipchoge on a podcast just the other day when I was at the gym and he was speaking about uh, the idea of running his own race and how for him, like one of the quicker zappers of energy is to worry about what every other athlete's doing. And um, I know firsthand from being a competitive bloke, and it's it's interesting in the running world, especially when you're a junior, seeing the rates of development of certain athletes. And you, I remember as a as a sort of a 22 year old looking at a 17 year old Gregson, going, "Oh my gosh, like like is this what you're up against?" And pretty quickly, any improvement that you see in your own running can all of a sudden just feel as though it's not a big enough improvement, or it can it can. I, I, I immediately understood what Kipchoge is talking about as just that energy and enthusiasm for training being zapped away. And one thing he said that he's trained himself to do over the years was whenever he's in a race, regardless of whether he's dominating or whether he's struggling, is he goes into, into a race with a, a fair idea of the plan that he has, what time he wants to run, where he wants to make his moves potentially. Um, he said he's not so stringent with it that he can't adapt to other things which will inevitably come up. But he said that when he's out there and he's focused on that, then it doesn't matter whether he's suffering or whether he's feeling fantastic because he doesn't have to look around his shoulder to see if there's any other athletes chasing him down because it is just his own race. And 
I think there's an element of weight lifted off your shoulder if you can apply that, especially, I mean, it's true, I'm 35 and it's still true to me, but especially for, for any young athletes listening out there, I always find that if you can just take some joy in the progress of your own performance and um, as you say, let it come to you, put in the work and, and let the results take care of themselves, essentially, there's, I don't know, it just it makes running so much more of an enjoyable sport. You don't have to constantly be tense with the question of, you know, whether you're not, whether or not you're living up to the expectations of, you know, maybe your coach or uh, that, that competitive expectations of where you should be in a field. Um, the OCD element, I reckon, in distance running is funny as well. Like you can exp explain all this theoretically. And then when you say, okay, like here's a, here's a cool concept, apply that. It's like, yeah, but um, I just want to win and I want to train more. And surely if I can just do that, <laughs> it's going to lead to better results. I always find that a difficult um balance to have with with new and older athletes even when i was sort of 10 15 years into my own career i knew recovery was as important as a, a long run in many respects so i could get back out there and do it but there was something at the back of my mind which constantly goes up come on tice like there's certain athletes who are running 200 k's a week can you really justify taking uh taking some more time off so i, I reckon that's it that i guess that fits under the umbrella of attitude like you just explained but have you noticed this with certain t personalities in your group being a, a challenging thing to help them to apply? Yeah, I, everyone wants to go from zero to hero. They don't want to do all the steps in between. And that's just the world that we live in. And, you know, when you were saying before, you know, there are guys that you're racing against that are doing 200 kilometres and you shouldn't afford yourself the luxury of doing things. They never always did 200 kilometres, right? They would have started out probably about 120 and built up to 150 and then maybe 160, 180, and then they got to 200. What happens is we see 200 and we automatically think that that's what we need to do if we want to be good. And I always laugh when an athlete brings out a book. It's always the best stuff that's in there. You never, ever see the majority of what their career was, which was average, boring, crappy, miserable, frustrating, you know, just mind-blowing stuff that really got them to be good and that's life like we have that in our life everyone is the same but people don't want to show that right because again they're on this pedestal and they've got to be something that they're not and promote themselves as something that we're not and i think that's where the disconnect with social media comes from because what you see sometimes doesn't tell the whole story so there's a number of steps that need to be taken and i look where i start with an athlete and I know how long it's going to take them. And I keep telling them that if they're after a shortcut, I'm not their coach. Now, if they're prepared to do the work, and I always work in uh, four-year cycles when it comes to Olympic Games, that if you're prepared to put in the work, and we're talking every day for 365 days of a year, times that by four, so we're talking 1,300 days, you know, that's where the beauty of success comes and the personal growth. You know, and there's no doubt that being an athlete, the commitment, the dedication, the honesty, the hard work, um, you know, the uh, the failures, you know, the successes, you put all that together and that makes a person, right? When you're, when you're talking to a runner that has gone through all that and done all that, there straight away is a camaraderie that is unexplainable compared to just talking to someone you meet on the street, right? Like, I had a guy that jumped in my group tonight. He's a triathlete. He's here from France. He's a young kid. And, you know, he sent me some emails and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, why don't you just come along and we'll see how you go. And, of course, tonight I got to see that he's actually a pretty good runner. And just in the conversation I had with him, I could just tell that he's going to be a great asset, you know, for my group and my group will be a great asset for him over the next four months while he's here. So there is just something that, you know, those that have been successful have all done it right. No, running, running, unfortunately, doesn't allow people to take shortcuts, right? Even those that have natural talent when they're younger, if they don't start to apply the work and put the processes in place when they're older, they end up having a very short career. And we've seen a number of athletes that have been like that. We've also seen late bloomers that weren't that talented when they were younger but then all of a sudden the penny drops and then all of a sudden they find consistency and they're in a great routine and they're starting to have some success, which then fuels more success and more dedication. And they end up going on to be, to be great athletes. So again, way back at the start, you talked about the cookie cutter process. There's no such thing as the cookie cutter process because every athlete is different. 
they've come from different backgrounds, there's different needs, there's different wants, um, but you just want to make sure they've got the right attitude and they're going to buy in to the plan and the process. And, you know, I let go of a couple of athletes uh, a few weeks ago because they just didn't have the attitude. They were just wasting my time. And to be quite frank, they were just wasting their own time. You know, talk is cheap and I wasn't seeing any form of productivity in their training or their racing that really justified what was coming out of their mouth. So, you know, I'm too old now to really be sitting there trying to convince athletes. You know, if I have to convince you, then you Mm. should not be here. You know, athletes should want it. I always say it's like you've got this wild stallion. Me as a coach, I should be holding them back, right? I shouldn't have to be kicking them up the bum and getting them motivated and getting them to do the things that they should already know what to do. So um, it's certainly been a process of elimination when it comes to being a coach, because I also have to take care of my own mental and emotional needs. Um, And yeah, I think, you know, over the last three or four years since John's death, I've been able to find that great balance and surround myself with just great people that all have different goals. And when they achieve them, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, the idea of natural talent's an interesting conversation as well. I used to look at natural talent as being how well a person could run off little training. And if they could run fast, having not trained that much, I go, okay, well, natural talent's high. And that's one element of it, obviously. But the other element of it that I learned through what you touched on then was the, uh, I guess it's a natural talent that can also be developed to just be consistent and to keep rocking up because it's an incredible how many athletes, like you say, didn't quite reach their potential because they would come out sporadically and, you know, train here and there like heroes and then never follow up where you would see other athletes who might not have the same level of natural talent, but they had the ability just to keep grinding and grinding. And um, as you say, the penny eventually clicks. That's always inspiring and something that I think is, is well, in, in my own mind was looked over too easily, especially when I was a, a young fella. Yeah, I mean... Look, I think everyone has an ability, but it's then using your talent to make sure that that ability shines. And again, it's just everyone's different. There's no one way that fits everyone sort of scenario. But what I love about team culture is that once you've got one person that buys in, the attitude of everyone else buys in. And everyone doesn't have to be exactly the same in order to get the same results. They've just got to excel in their own ability and use the talent that they have to be able to get the end result. And, you know, in my group, we've got a great culture. You know, I don't accept anything less than them giving their best. Like mediocrity is not an option for me. I mean, again, I had an athlete that on um, Friday did a workout and he got his ass kicked by an athlete that should not have come close to him and so today at the workout I said to him beforehand I hope I'm going to see a better result and he's just like oh coach I don't know what was wrong with me and I was like well you should have kicked his butt but you didn't and I said so if you train to the level of your ability you're going to push him to be better and he goes oh you're going to tell me you didn't have a bad day and I said yeah but my worst day was the best day for some athletes right Mm. a day that I'm off and I'm struggling those athletes all of a sudden got a smell and they were able to get onto me, but it still pushed me to be competitive to make sure that those athletes still finished behind me. It wasn't like I was having a bad day and then I just let some athlete that was slower than me all of a sudden dominate me in training, right? So it's that attitude of always knowing that you are good and that you belong. And then when things get hard, you can still hang in there and grind. And he's young, he'll, he'll learn, but I certainly wasn't going to listen to his sob story on him getting his butt handed to him in a workout that even though he was going bad, he should have still been able to finish ahead of that guy. But he just, his head dropped and he just, his head wasn't in it. And to me, training really mimics racing. And if you can't flick the switch in training, then how are you going to do it in a race? And Steve Monaghetti was the king of that. You know, he would come to training and he'd be moaning and he'd be like, oh, I think I've got him. And then you get halfway through the workout and he would just go bang and blow you apart because all of a sudden you're like, you're listening to what he's saying and then you're thinking, okay, he's having a bad one, so I should be able to easily whoop him. And he would just hang on. He would weather the punches for the first half of the workout and you kept saying he's going to drop because he's already told me he's not feeling well and he never would. 
and then he would throw in a surge and you'd be like, hang on a second, you told me that <laughs> you're not feeling great. And it took me a while to learn that art, that when I got to races, I could do exactly the same thing. And it really takes a lot of work to be able to do that because when you get tired, the first thing you do is you start coming up with excuses. And it takes a fairly strong-minded athlete to all of a sudden go, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hang in here and I'm going to surge and I'm going to dominate. And I think the more that you can throw in that positive reinforcement, the better athlete it makes you and the better racer it makes you. So, you know, there's so many tricks to the trade to, to try and get right. And, you know, as I said, there are just some athletes that get it and they are able to make that their mantra. And there are some athletes that train like champions, but then they race like, you know, draft horses when it comes to getting out there and they just can't translate what is needed. You know, they either train too hard, um, they don't have the right mental psyche when it comes to, to racing, you know, especially guys that dominate training, but then race poorly. Um, just, you know, sometimes that's the old saying, they, they train like Tarzan and race like Jane. And I know I probably shouldn't say it in this day and <laughs> no, age, right? No, it's welcome. Um, it's welcome on this yeah, podcast. I, 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 I love all females and males, and, you know, but yeah, it's, it's an old uh, saying. So. Yeah, it's funny. We have to justify it. I remember um, I, I, when I used to do a little bit of teaching, I got myself in trouble because we used to call push-ups like just where you do your standard push-ups, just normal push-ups. And we used to call the ones where you go on your knees, girl push-ups. And I went into this classroom in year seven. So I said, oh, if you can't do these, just do girl push-ups. And about four year seven girls fired up at me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to learn the new names. I know what it's like, the um, <clears throat> the feeling of, uh, of of not being sure what you're allowed to say. But it's a good point. Troopy, I was interested to go back to, to what you were saying about the athlete that had a bad day the other day and how he challenged you saying, what, you, don't tell me you never had a bad day. During during those periods of like that we all have uh, in in the world of running, where you're going through a period of, for whatever reason, things aren't clicking, you're not performing at the standard that you uh, you know you, you should be performing at. How did you navigate those periods? Like, did you have certain people that you spoke to, certain things that you did? Because um, it's a difficult thing in terms of developing that consistency. I think that's one of the biggest downfalls for the athletes that I work with as well. Is they'll hit a period of going, okay, I should be quicker than this. And before you know it, if you're not careful, just that inconsistency starts to poke its head up. Yeah. I mean, I was sort of lucky and unlucky in certain ways. I mean, I was self-coached. I had Mona as an advisor. And if things weren't going great, you know, I could chat to Mona and, you know, I'd listen to what he said and, you know, I'd either take on what he said or I wouldn't. Um, and again, it gets back to I was an extrovert. So if things weren't going great for me, I'd go out and hang out with some friends that weren't runners and drink beers and get them to make me feel good about myself again before I jump back into the running world because the running world can be really polarizing. It can also be really toxic. Um, and so I always found that I could have that break out and come back. I guess the current situation I can tell you about is Jake Riley. You know, Jake Riley, you know, in 2019 came back from, uh, Achilles surgery and ran uh, 210 at Chicago, top American, went into the Olympic trials, you know, finished second, made the Olympic Games, great story. Uh, COVID hit. So then the next 18 months, he and many athletes were just basket cases, not knowing if the Olympics were going to happen. And then they, he was on such a roll, like he'd had two 210 marathons back to back before the Olympics were taken away from him. And then, you know, got back into training, got to the Olympics, but he started trying to take shortcuts with his diet and he ended up developing Red S. And then that derailed once the uh, Olympics were over and we got to Boston in 2022 and it was just a shit show. And he had Red S, so his whole um, body uh, was out of whack. Uh, his Achilles flared up, but then this other side of the Achilles was getting sore. So we took some time out went and spoke to a sports doctor, uh, spoke to a nutritionist, started to address the Red S stuff, went and then chatted to uh, some surgeons, decided that we're going to do a double Achilles uh, operation. Now, that's a lot to take on in April of 2022, knowing that in less than two years, the 2024 Olympic trials are coming up. And simple question was like, do you still believe that you can make the Olympics? He's like, yes, I think I can. And I'm like, well, then this is what you need to do. And so he did it. And there's been really nothing 
for the remainder of 2022. He got married and, you know, did, did all his rehab. He's done everything right. But we now move into 2023. And he's gone from doing all his rehab, doing walking, jogging, to now this is his second week of full training. Two weeks, or probably four weeks ago, he got smashed by Carrie Verdon, my top female, in a workout. Following week, he gets smashed by a couple of college kids. Week later, gets smashed by a couple of guys that are two twenty-four guys. And he makes the comment to me, he just goes, I don't know if my heart's in it. Hmm. And so I called him and said, hey, I think you and I need to have a beer. And I sat down with him and I was just like, look, before we go anywhere in this conversation, if you don't want to run, I'll support you. If you decide that you want to retire, I'll support you. I was like, mate, you made the Olympics, something that you dreamed about that become a reality. You know, I don't want you going through this misery, chasing something that's not going to be there unless your heart's in it. And he was quick just to turn around and say that, you know, his confidence had taken a beating. You know, he was struggling in training to beat athletes that were, you know, of lesser ability than him. And I had to make him see that each week has been an improvement. It started off with Carrie went to some college kids, went to some 224 guys. You know, now he's hanging on to the back of a couple of 218 guys. So in a very short period of time, there has been these very small improvements. You know, he started off when he was running, looking like an octopus in a washing machine. Now he only looks like half an octopus in a washing machine. So (laughs) he's getting better every single week, but he's comparing himself to 210. He's comparing himself to when he made the Olympics. Now that Sebastian Coe has screwed up the whole sport of athletics and everything is based on point system and no one knows how you're going to get in on points or if you have to run 208, he's now fretting out and he doesn't know what he's got to do. And he's like, I've got to do these you know, platinum races to score points and I've got to do this. And I'm just like, Jake, you just got to be fit and get to the Olympic trials. And if you finish in the top three, I don't know how you can not make the team. Like Mm. it's always been tradition. Whoever are the top three Americans make the Olympic games. It would be a tragedy. So I'm trying to get him to not get caught up in the wooders, the coulders, the shooters, and to be focused on him and where he is and to see the very small improvements that he's making. So, you know, I guess I've gone the long way around it, but to help athletes that all of a sudden are in these funks, it takes positive reinforcement. And I'm certainly not telling him, anything by trying to blow sunshine out of his bum. I'm telling him the reality of what I see. And he trusts me as someone that's been a a student of the sport, now a coach of the sport. He trusts what I say. And I'm only telling him what I see. Now, I can't change how he feels. But I hope that through common sense and through honesty, he can take that and he can be like, all right, I've just got to keep working. And so like tonight, he did a workout and Again, it was a step in the right direction. He said he started to feel fluent and he started to feel like he got some leg turnover. Now, some of those guys that he wants to beat are still in front of him, but he's nowhere near as bad as what he was four to six weeks ago. So we're on top of his diet. He's actually backed off a little bit in his gym and strength work, which he he gives 100% to everything. But I think you can't do that, particularly as you get older, like he's 34. So you can't train like you're a 22 year old. You don't recover as well. You're you're not creating natural uh, human growth hormone for the body to recover. And so he needs more rest and he needs more recovery. And we're just balancing out that. But you know, I went through those same frustrations when I was 36, 38, and I was still running. You know, mentally, I still thought I was 22. Unfortunately, the body just wouldn't comply with all the things that I wanted. So with Jake, this hunger and this fire is going to help him. My job is to make sure that I have the right plan for him, that as things keep improving and he keeps moving along, that then all of a sudden he's back into where he was. He feels like an elite athlete. His performances show that he's an elite athlete and he's happy to be an elite athlete again. Yeah, that sounds impressive. How how long ago did you say he had his operation? So he had his operation in May of last year. And again, it was a double Achilles uh, operation. So he was on crutches, like wheelchair crutches. Um, you know, had to go through the whole process of what we'd gone through in 2018. Except in 2018, it was only one one leg. This time it was two. Um, and he's just so dedicated and committed. He does all the things that have needed to be done through his rehab. What we did differently this time around was that I didn't let him get too far ahead. So 
when this happened last time, we had two setbacks because he pushed the envelope just a little bit too much. And then we'd have to come back, regroup and go again. This time around and knowing that we do have a very short timeline. I mean, the Olympic trials are basically just over a year away. Um, we need to do everything right. We can't afford to have setbacks. And like I said, I from what I see, I think by the time we get to mid-March, um, I'll throw him into a, a local fun run and he'll probably get his butt kicked by a couple of uh, club fun runners. But that'll be the start to then doing races that each race will be of a higher level. And then before you know it, he's lining up at Berlin Marathon and he should be back to hopefully running 210 or quicker. Yeah, there's something nice about that as well. Like hopefully you can tap into that mindset that you've tapped into because I, I've got a new appreciation for, I haven't run competitively for seven or eight years now, but I've just started, as I said, to train for the marathon. And like when you've just been going out and running 6Ks at five minute K pace for a couple of years, that first couple of sessions are exciting because you go out and you start running 430s and you're like, oh, okay, well, that's that's not great. But then you go out the next week, you run 410s. You go, well, that's an incredible improvement. And there's a part of me that each week you go out and you run a little bit quicker that gets you up and about. Now, I'm not trying to make any Olympic Games or qualify for any huge races, but that same attitude seems to apply. So it sounds like he's in a nice place, really, 12 months out, hanging on to the back of a couple of 224 boys, did you say, 218 boys? Yeah, and I mean, and to your point, like each week you shouldn't be going out there to run faster, right? Because your body, Mm -hmm. like everyone's able to do that in their training. And as soon as they start to stagnate, all of a sudden they want to keep pushing. And when you stagnate, I reckon that's the most beautiful part of training because that's where your body is actually absorbing everything Mm. that's going on. And as it stagnates and your body absorbs it, it then does that. But when people hit that, they try to train too hard and they start to do that. And so it's a very fine line. And that's why communication with your athletes is extremely important. And there is nothing wrong with running slow. You know, you've got to give your body a chance to recover and to rejuvenate so that you can do the harder sessions harder and you can do the longer runs further. If you just try to bang everything out, your body is going to end up breaking down. And it might not so much when you're young, but that mentality that you build stays the same. And I see it religiously with collegiate athletes here in the US. Now, when you go to college here, you're there for four years, The coach only cares about indoors, outdoors, and cross-country championships. And it's like the Kenyan system. They're in there for four years. They train them hard. They try to get as many points as they can. They're used to doing easy runs hard. Their long runs are all at six-minute mile pace or quicker. And then all of a sudden, you know, they finish college and they're like, you know what, I think I might do this for a couple of years. And then when you tell them it's going to take another couple of years before they become a professional athlete, they then look at how hard they've trained for four years and they're like, I don't know if I can do this for another two years. So, you know, it's, you've got to be mindful of, you know, and particularly athletes that I've taken out of college, trying to reset the mental, the physical and the emotional barometer so that not every day has to be lived like it's their last day, that they can actually see the forest for the trees and they know how long it's going to take, where they've got to go. Little setbacks are fine. You still stay focused on on where you're going so that you can create that stability. Like I call it even Steven. Even Steven training is so boring. There's nothing exciting about it. But if you could do that for a year, you're going to be fit and you're going to be strong and you're going to race well. If you try to push the envelope and try to be a Harry hero, you run the risk of getting injured. And then if you've got to have time out, that leads to inconsistency. It also means that your fitness levels start to drop. And then when you come back, you've got to spend that time trying to get fit again, trying to get healthy again. And so there's just too much up and down. So consistency, keep it even. Running easy is fine. Sometimes it's great not to wear a GPS watch. You know, don't be caught on Strava or trying to download all your information or putting it all on social media for the world to see. I mean, one thing I say to my athletes, every bit of training that I see from my athletes' competitors is training that helps me. Because I know where they're at. And I also know if they're training too hard because a lot of these kids that put their training out train at a level that they don't race at. And so you know that they're racing their training rather than training for races. So um, again, it's just taking that perspective. You know, I've been around a long time and you know the athletes that I coach trust me and we look at it through a very balanced lens so that they understand, but they also know it's not about today and it's not about tomorrow. It's about those 365 days of the year 
that are all important. Mm. That, yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Trippy, one more before I before I let you go. I was just going to ask sort of on that, the, the idea of stagnation and improvement and stagnation and improvement. Collis Birmingham said that to me years ago. I'd been running sort of 354 for 1500 about five weeks in a row. And he said, oh, yeah, you look like you're ready to run fast. I said, oh, what do you mean? Like this is, I've stagnated a little bit. And he, he explained the theory that you just explained to me then. And it was within about four months, I went out and ran 349. And it, it stuck with me ever since because it was a big PB. And I just thought, oh, I'd never really considered that. I just thought I was sort of at the threshold of, of you know, or maybe I was a threshold of what my body could do at the time. But then, as you say, I absorbed that. So with the marathon, though, with the 16-week build-up, say, before the big race, how much did that block vary or, or change in comparison to sort of your base training, which was taking place throughout the rest of the year? For me, it was more the mental attitude that changed. Like, I was always doing two-and-a-half-hour runs on a Sunday. You know, I mean, I was doing 160K a week when I was 16 years of age. I've always been a high mileage guy. But I'd still do two and a half hours on a Sunday when I wasn't even training for the marathon. Um, I didn't have to. It was like two to two and a half hours. But it, once I knew I was in that 16-week period, it was the mental focus of knowing that I couldn't go out, I couldn't party, couldn't drink, you know, stay dedicated to my craft. I mean, I was sponsored, so you owe it to your sponsors to do it. Make sure I was getting PT, make sure I was getting massage, make sure I was doing my gym work, make sure I was getting nine hours sleep, making sure my diet was in intact. So my whole mental approach changed. And then it also changed in my training. You know, I could turn up to training and I could spend a few weeks just training with guys. And if I wanted to turn it on, I could. And if I didn't want to turn it on, I didn't. But if I was in a prep for a race, I turned it on every time. You know, like mm. I was competitive, like you know, I'd be banging out that 20 minute monofartlek and I'd be trying to run 1730 for the lake, you know, or I'd be doing Deke's quarters and I'd be trying to run 1330 for Deke's quarters, or I'd be doing the Benson's Benson's Hills with Mona on a, uh, on a Saturday trying to run 21 minutes. Like it was always just, just training hard. And then, but we'd go out and we do our long run the next day and run two and a half hours. It would be at a slow, relaxed pace. Like we'd be very social with people. Like Mona and I would run from our houses to where the group would meet and you'd know this and it would be an hour and a half for all the local guys. And then Mona and I would do an extra half an hour running home. And you know, we never banged it out. I mean, there was a few Sundays we'd bang it out if we had some Melbourne guys that wanted to come up and sort of have the chest out, try to two step us. And uh, <laughs> Mona and I would, uh, would take tag teams in, uh, in burying them. But <laughs> the whole thing in that, in that process was just my attitude. And all the other things that I had to do to complement my training and just the change in, in training focus. Um, and again, my training was the same, but it just meant where I had to be more focused was when I was in the business end of training for a race. And then when I wasn't, well, then I could just relax and just what it, do whatever. As long as I was still training, like it didn't, it, it didn't matter. I mean, I was still putting uh, pennies in the bank. And mm -hmm. it's important to know that, that, you know, you don't have to be putting in like, so I use two analogies here when it comes to training. One of these I stole from Julian Painter, uh, who ran at the um, Atlanta Olympics in 96 in the 5K. And he said, training, every day of training is like a sheet of paper. And you can easily grab it and rip that sheet of paper. But all of a sudden, if you put seven days together, there's seven and you can still rip through it. But you want to try to accumulate a phone book. And probably kids today don't know what a phone book is because they've all got iPhones. But a phone book, obviously a very thick um, book like that. And you could bend it, but you could never rip it. And that showed strong base. And the other analogy that I, I use is it's like putting money in the bank. So every day you're training, you're putting money in the bank. Now, there's going to be a period of time where you get injured and you're going to have to take withdrawals out of that account. But you want to make sure that each year you're putting money in. You don't want to be putting in big deposits and then having to make big withdrawals, right? Just every day, just throwing in a penny. And before you know it, after three or four years of training, you've actually got some wealth behind you. And that's security in, you know, physical strength, mental strength and emotional strength. So, you know, there's no shortcuts. You have to put in the work. You also, you know, you can't be a dimmer switch, Right a dimmer light switch. You can't just sort of turn it on when you want and turn it on. You're either on or off. And I feel for me, that's how I used to be. Like if I was on, I was on 16 week training. I'm not here to screw around. This is my job. But when I was off, I was off, right? Like I would go to races, like I'll run a marathon four or five weeks. and I'd jump on a plane and go to Bernie 
and I would get my butt handed to me every single time I ran at Bernie. Now, I wasn't in shape. I'd had spent four to six weeks drinking, going out with friends, living life. But when I went to that race at Bernie and I got my butt kicked, that was the time for me to go, right, playtime's over. I've got my butt kicked. Now let's get ready for Zatapec. And I'd always run well at Zatapec. And then I'd go straight up to Falls Creek and I'd spend three weeks up at Falls Creek training before I'd get ready for, you know, the Melbourne Grand Prix or World Cross Country or London Rotterdam Marathon. So, and people would always ask me, like, why would I go to Bernie, you know, at the level of the athlete that I was and not prepare? I mean, I couldn't prepare because I was recovering, but get my ass kicked. Well, I feed it off that. I would be angry that I get my butt kicked and it would just be the catalyst to get me going again. So they were things that worked for me. They're not going to work for every athlete. Again, we talked about personalities and how do you morph the training in and around that. And, you know, for me, that just, that worked. I mean, I got 20 years out of myself um, doing that. And, you know, I got to go to three Olympics and got to run some, you know, fantastic races. And, you know, but once I sort of got to 37, 38, it just became a heck of a lot harder, but mentally I couldn't break out of that cycle that I was in. And hence when I started getting injury after injury after injury, that I ended up just having to walk away uh, from it. Now, I've just started back running. I turned 50 in uh, in March. I've just got back into running after a four-year hiatus. And I can tell you it's bloody hard when you've uh, whacked on, you know, quite a few kilograms. Um, <laughs> but in saying that, you know, I'm at a point now where I just want to get back and be healthy. You know, yeah. like I, I work about 12, 14 hours a day uh, from coaching and programs and putting on racing events and things like that. And, you know, it certainly hasn't been to my uh, benefit of health, um, but I've got my daughter now that's starting to run. She's doing track for the first time. And, you know, so getting to go for a little run with her is actually really therapeutic. And yeah. the fact now that I'm not, I've had four years out of being super competitive. I've got a new appreciation for it and a new love for it. So if I can get back to three or four times a day, running just, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, then I'm going to be golden. I'm going to be happy with that. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Like we've talked about so many things throughout my career and, you know, I'm sitting here now going, God, that, that was just so long ago, but <laughs> in my head, I feel like it was yesterday. Oh, I get it. Nah, I get it, Trippy. I'm I'm 36, and I, I feel like I've already started to get a little bit of a glimpse at that that speed uh, that speed warp a little bit because I'll, I'll look back at the the marathon that I ran, and it feels like just a couple of day, a couple of years ago it was five years ago this year. So I, I can appreciate where you're coming from, but no, nah, Trippy, I've gone a little bit over what I said I would with you, but um, just always great sitting down and picking your brain and just having a chat about running. So hey, mate, thanks so much for for jumping back on. My pleasure, and best of luck with the marathon. Cheers, Troopy. I'll leave you to it. See you later, everybody.